It's Thursday night and you're watching Crypto Trader on CNBC Africa, the world's first televised cryptocurrency investment show. On a week where everyone's talking about forks, what should we talk about? Well, we're going to talk about forks. Hard forks, soft forks, and who gives a fork? Lauren Gamarov, uh, you're back in my studio and we're talking about forks. Thank you. Let's talk about the first significant fork that happened, the Bitcoin Cash fork that happened when the chain split and we got this Bitcoin Cash coin which was bigger block sizes and better transactions. That coin went to six, seven, eight hundred dollars and it came back down to like three hundred dollars. Are you a Bitcoin Cash man? Yes, I am. Uh, you know, uh, Bitcoin Cash was uh, in response to this whole scaling debate. You know, uh, Bitcoin's beginning more popular, and uh, what we have now is this problem where, you know, we just don't have the transaction volume. Transactions are slow and they're expensive, and so there's been this kind of split in the community on how to scale Bitcoin. Uh, and uh, cash was this uh, answer to that problem, where we could now have these bigger blocks and process more transactions at a much lower cost. So if cash is the answer to the problem, why is cash only trading at 300 bucks? Well, you know, because it's uh, not the main kind of uh, chain, uh, people are, 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 are skeptical about whether or not it will succeed. Um, but I think what you'll see over, the, over time is that because it just has better qualities and better traits than the core uh, one, which uh, basically they're trying to uh, use new technology called Lightning Network to scale Bitcoin, that's, you know, unproven. Um, I think what will happen over time is that Bitcoin Cash will become the dominant chain. So they're using off-chain technologies to try and, and scale Bitcoin and there's a new fork coming up sometime between the 18th and 25th of November, there's the 2x fork. Do you think that that's going to make Bitcoin competitive to Bitcoin Cash as a peer-to-peer -peer cash transfer system? Well, that's the idea, that's the hope, that with that small upgrade in block size that we'll be able to have more transactions per second. But as we can see, what's happening now is more people are becoming interested in cryptocurrency, you know, uh, regulators are becoming more friendly uh, towards it, and eventually what's going to happen is people are going to want to be able to buy things at the grocery store and all that uh, with, uh, with uh, cryptocurrency. But uh, the, I think that the way that it's developing at this time, you know, with these small scale upgrades, I don't think Bitcoin is going to succeed in that way. And that's why I'm very optimistic with Bitcoin Cash. So $300, are you switching your Bitcoin for Bitcoin Cash? Yes, I, I, I mean, I, I, I'm not uh, liquidating everything, but I certainly am buying Bitcoin Cash. That's what I like to hear. You know, one of our common friends, Adam, the Bitcoin Master, has been telling me that he's about a new fork, a Bitcoin gold fork. Adam, uh, welcome to our show. Um, this Bitcoin gold fork that you've been talking to me about since August, it's finally happening. Is it a, a real thing? Well, it's called Bitcoin Gold and its nickname is B Gold. And it is a friendly fork of Bitcoin that is happening on October 25th. So if you own Bitcoin before October 25th, then afterwards you're going to be entitled to the same amount of Bitcoin Gold, B Gold. Adam, okay, I got it, but how are they doing this? Do they have the support of the miners? Yes, they have the support of certain miners over there in China and they will be forking it off on their own, those miners. But this is, uh, they're using GPU mining, so it'll be easier for anyone to mine it. So there'll be other people jumping into mining also. So if I understand you correctly, what they're doing is they're splitting the Bitcoin chain and they're changing the way that they mine the Bitcoin into GPU mining, which means that effectively they're splitting the chain and making Bitcoin into like an altcoin. Yes, that is correct. It is, it's called B-Gold, but it is an altcoin. It's a unique way of forming a, an, an altcoin, a unique way of distributing the altcoin to people. I'm starting to feel like this is the beginning of a trend almost, where people count on chains to split so that they can get dividends for holding Bitcoin. Adam, do you think this is the beginning of a trend? Yes, I predicted this crypto dividend tre uh, trend. Um, it was successful with Bcash, and if it is even more successful or similarly successful with B Gold, which is friendly, which isn't trying to pretend to be Bitcoin, there are going to be a lot of other groups trying to do this. There's probably going to be one in Ethereum also. So holding has never been more lucrative in the Bitcoin space. So the one flaw of crypto is that you can't earn interest on crypto. You can't earn dividend interest or, or real interest on crypto unless, of course, you stake your coins. But now with this, are you going to be able to earn a return on your crypto? Yes, Bitcoin is now a productive asset. It is a productive asset. That's what I think people have been, been looking for. They, they want Bitcoin to be a productive asset, so they do risky things with their Bitcoin. But you don't have to do anything with your Bitcoin for it to be a productive asset. You get these crypto dividends thanks to these people who want to create their own altcoins by forking the popular Bitcoin. 
But what's the use case for Bitcoin Gold? There must be a use case. Well, I think it's the similar use case for Litecoin. It's just a backup to to Bitcoin, a way to peer to peer transactions, a uh, a store of value, just everything that Bitcoin is, everything that Litecoin is. But uh, just done a different way. There are many altcoins out there that you know, do similar things. These people have their own gimmick. So I think on my end, I'm just happy that it's I'm getting this for free. And I think a lot of other people will be very excited about that too. The market will decide. The market will decide. For all the traders out there, they'll be able to dump their B gold right away, or they can try to hang on to it. It's it's up to them. Everyone will have to figure it out for themselves. Decide what the market says. When I look at Litecoin, Litecoin has a different proposition from Bitcoin. And if I look at, for example, Bitcoin Cash, Bitcoin Cash has eight megabyte blocks, which can increase transaction size. What's the proposition of Bitcoin Gold? Well, it's it's the GPU mining decentralizes the mining. It's uh, to make sure that no miner or no group of miners can take over or dictate what happens to the coin. I think a lot of the people are worried, were worried about that with Bitcoin. There's a lot of uh, fear, uncertainty, and doubt that people spread. That's why they're doing this 2x uh, hard fork, or some call it the Bizcoin hard fork. But th this is to decentralize it. So if if you want to be involved in a coin that isn't, isn't going to be threatened by miners, this is the way to go. This is what their gimmick is. Adam, when is the Bitcoin gold fork actually happening? October the 25th, you, you have to hold Bitcoin by and then November 1st is the day is the day it's probably going to be distributed is the day it's probably going to start. I'm, I'm not 100 percent sure. I contacted by people over there all the time. They're at btcgpu.org. You can find out more there. And do you think that the exchanges are going to be supporting this Bitcoin gold split? Yeah, I believe they're going to go through with that, although it is very similar to Bcash. Um, it, the, the people are determined they're going to, they're going to do their thing. It's going to be after November 15th, I believe. Um, but there's no, the replay protection is really sketchy on that right now. And so basically they have to get their replay protection a hundred percent certain before I would try to get into it. A replay protection just basically protects you from people stealing your Bitcoin by doing a two X transaction um that there's there's a long shot that something like that could happen but there's that's the b gold people have replay protection so one of the things that people are not happy about with 2x is that there is not a good replay protection yet adam the million dollar question when the split happens and you get your bitcoin gold are you going to hold your bitcoin gold or are you going to sell them For, i'm going to hold it at first definitely because i saw with with b cash that the price it went up, it went up at first. And I really think this friendly fork, because they're doing this, they're not trying to pretend to be Bitcoin. It's a new thing, it could it could go up. So I, I'm definitely gonna hold most of it at first. Um, perhaps get rid of some of it, of course. I mean, I mean, if it's over, you're gonna be tempted. If it's over a hundred dollars, you know, you're gonna have to get rid of some of it. But yeah, at, at first, definitely the bulk of it, I will hold on to. Uh, now that we've seen uh, Bitcoin Cash successively fork off the main chain, um, I think there's going to be a lot of opportunists who are thinking in the same way that they can now create their own new fork and you know with new traits and they could capitalize on that and get free money. So I, I think that uh, this is just an opportunistic play. I don't think Bitcoin Gold has any long-term prospects. I think in the short term people will trade it. I mean, of course, it's a ticker symbol. People will trade, um, but I don't feel that it adds anything new to this the ecosystem. What about the decentralization of mining? I mean, it does kind of decentralize mining. We have got a, a centralization problem of mining in China where lots of the, the mining is happening in China and the manufacturers of the mining equipment are actually holding on to the mining equipment because for them that's better than, than, than selling the mining equipment to miners. Um, maybe this GPU type mining does solve the problem. I don't think so. I think that the whole centralization of mining is overblown. I think that uh, people are using it to be able to uh, uh, decide that Bitcoin should be uh, uh, worked in a certain kind of way. And I'm not uh, worried about that whole mining centralization thing. I think that what uh, Bitcoin Gold is trying to do is they're saying, look, now everybody who's got a, a GPU, which is just a basic graphics card, can now mine uh, Bitcoins and uh, make a network more decentralized. But you know, that brings its own sorts of problems. You know, uh, 
with, with the way mining is done currently, it, it is actually quite resistant uh, against attack. You know, uh, we have this idea of botnets that can now go and co-opt people's machines. And I think that uh, with GPU mining, there's a, a problem there that it could be able to, uh, botnets could be able to be formed from these GPU uh, mines. But I don't think mining is centralized. I don't think it is an, an issue. I think that uh, this is just a small uh, uh, feature that they think is going to make people more comfortable with mining, de mining decentralization. But I don't think it, again, adds value. You know who usually does add a lot of value when we get him onto the show is uh, Jimmy Song. He's one of the Bitcoin core developers. And Jimmy, you are in LA and you're talking at BlockCon. Uh, before you start talking at BlockCon, I want to ask you, is this Bitcoin gold thing a, a real thing? Is it a thing? Yes, it, lo it definitely looks like a real fork. What they're doing is they are changing the proof of work. And the goal of doing that is to uh, decentralize mining. They feel like there's too much power in the hands of a few Chinese miners and by changing the proof of work to something called Equihash, uh, they're hoping that uh, it will be a more level playing field and people can use their CPUs and GPUs to mine. So Jimmy, if I've got this correctly, they're changing Bitcoin mining from ASIC type mining to CPU and GPU type mining in an effort to almost decentralize mining? Yeah, yeah, um, and uh, you know, there are specialized equipment manufacturers for yeah, Equihash. Uh, it, it just turns out that even the specialized equipment is only maybe 10 to 100 times better than GPUs or CPUs. Um, contrast that to Bitcoin, uh, eight, the best ASICs are about a million times better than a CPU. So, um, you know, it's it's much more level. You, you get 100 CPUs that's going to be equivalent to, you know, one one really, really good specialized thing. So um, definitely a lot more level and it's it's useful to sort of spread out, spread that out, or at least that's a theory. Cool, I got it, but surely not everyone can just rally support and split the Bitcoin chain. And I mean, in this case, the split is, it's quite a big split. I mean, they, they're turning Bitcoin into almost like an altcoin. Yeah, I mean, that's exactly what they're doing. And that is the right of everybody that's in Bitcoin is that you can hard fork whenever you want. That's that's kind of the design of it, um, you know, and it, it, it does seem like uh, people are using the hard fork um, sort of loophole to launch an altcoin. If you think about it, altcoins have sort of two main problems that they all have and that one is fair distribution and the other is getting exchanges to list them uh, anything that has both of those tends to be pretty high on the coin market cap charts and by hard forking bitcoin what you're doing is you are getting fair distribution because you're just giving it to people that already have it and the other uh, thing is that you know an exchange is going to have to give you whatever the hard fork coin is because of their fiduciary duty to you so um, it's only a little more work to distribute uh, things to you versus, you know, listing it on their exchange. So oftentimes a lot of these, uh, you know, all coin, uh, these hard forks will result in uh, all coins that get listed on these exchanges. OK, but what's the use case for Bitcoin Gold? Is it a peer to peer electronic cash system, another peer to peer electronic cash system? Or is it Bitcoin Gold, like the name says? Yeah, I think uh, you're right. It's it's a Bitcoin gold. Um, you know, Bitcoin Cash obviously had a very specific goal. Bitcoin Gold's um, you know goal would be instead of a medium of exchange, it would be something more like a store of value. I, I wouldn't say necessarily that it will be successful in doing so, but that seems to be the goal that their developers have. So you're gonna get uh, Bitcoin Gold uh, quite soon. When you get the Bitcoin Gold, are you gonna hold them or are you gonna sell them? I'm not sure. Most likely hold them. It depends on how high the price gets, obviously, if it's a very significant percentage of Bitcoin. So if the Bitcoin gold price over Bitcoin is like 0 0.01 or higher, I will probably take the time to uh, you know, get them out and list, get them to an exchange so I can sell them. Um, if, it, if it's below that, it's probably honestly not that worth it for me. Um, it's just you know, way too little to bother with, basically. Jimmy, I'm becoming a real fan of forks. I, I kind of think that forks allow for progression or stimulate progression. What are your thoughts? Do you think that forks are a way of achieving progression? So you ride a chain until you believe that you can add more value than the current chain is, is adding, and then you split it, get some support and you split it. Do you think these forks actually add more value and allow us to keep progressing? Uh, 
It's a great question. I, I, I think it can be a good thing uh, in part. I, I mean, at the very least, it's it's better than an altcoin, right? In, in the sense that you have fair distribution and people aren't sort of just mining, pre-mining a ton of money and like keeping it for themselves. Um, at the same time, you know, uh, I think this will eventually lead to innovation where exchanges will become completely decentralized. You can have atomic swaps and things like that. Um, and, you know, exchanges won't necessarily take custody of your Bitcoin. And that will eventually lead to, uh, you know, a situation where these hard forks won't be hacking the fiduciary duty uh, that these exchanges have. Um, but that's many years away. I think that's the way we're headed if these things become more popular, though. That Jimmy Song is really one of my favorite people in the Bitcoin community. He's just a wealth of knowledge and he's so humble about everything that he knows. And Lauren, he kind of shares your views. I mean, he, he also believes that it's not a real thing and um, that, it, that it's just a lot of hype and people trying to capitalize on something. Yes, absolutely. I think Jimmy Song is definitely a, a neutral voice in the community. Um, it's become very polarized, you know, with people forming opinions on either one or the other side. Um, I also think that, you know, most people who are getting into crypto nowadays are, are not technically savvy. And so they depend on uh, authorities to be able to guide them. And uh, when it comes to how Bitcoin has been developed up till now, most people are, are, are you know, because they don't know any better, are willing to trust the, the core group of developers because they've sort of taken us this far but I think you know with any technology uh, uh, it's just because Bitcoin is here doesn't mean it's going to uh, remain in its current state I think that uh, the core group are, are diverting things a little in the wrong sort of way but uh, certainly Jimmy Song is a voice that I also trust uh, and I appreciate because of his neutrality. Spencer Bogart wrote an article in Forbes where he spoke about airdrops or people using the Bitcoin and the Ethereum network to literally airdrop or split the chain to give other people's tokens in new projects and he said it was better to do that than to use use ICOs because ICOs kind of have a reach of 20, 30,000 people. Whereas if you do an airdrop, you're essentially getting the whole community. Spencer, I know you're in LA and you're at BlockCon, but I thought I'd ask you a few questions about your article. First of all, what do you make of the up and coming forks on Bitcoin, gold and 2x that's coming up? Yeah, I mean, there's a lot of different aspects here. I mean, there's certainly, you know, we have certain portions of the community that have uh, have different interests than perhaps other segments of the community. And so they're branching off to take Bitcoin in different directions. You know, in the case of Bitcoin Gold, it's changing the mining algorithm. Um, in the case of Bitcoin Cash, it's to allow for greater throughput and potentially lower fees. Um, and so we're seeing lots of different competing interests and visions for what Bitcoin can be. And hard forking is, is one way for everyone to kind of go after their own goals. What, what's the downside of forks? So you, you ride the chain until you believe that you can add more value. And then what you do is you split. So what's the downside of forks? Right. So the bad side is that it's disruptive to the ecosystem on the one hand. So a lot of times we see these exchanges, uh, you know, they might have to pause operations during this to make sure that customers funds are safe. Um, and they might pause those operations for anywhere from 12, 24, 48 hours around a hard fork. So that's one aspect. And then there's also branding confusion. So when we have we go from Bitcoin to Bitcoin Gold to Bitcoin Cash. Uh, you know, we have lots of different things that sound and look a lot like Bitcoin, but aren't. And so that can cause some confusion in the market. Spencer, you wrote an article which went viral, an article in Forbes, and you spoke about airdrops. What is this concept of an airdrop? Yeah, sure. So whether we're talking about airdrops or hard forks, again, this is probably a continuum between them. But the idea is, is the major idea between them that's common is the idea of distributing tokens to the users of another coin. So if I'm gonna create a new token or a new coin out there, I might distribute it to all holders of Bitcoin or all holders of Ethereum. So you're clearly a, a big fan of, of airdrops. Are you a fan of people joining chains, uh, riding the chain until a point where they don't agree, where they believe they can add more value and then splitting off the chain? Are, are you a fan of that? I'm not even sure how I feel about it just yet. What, what I am certain of, though, is that it's inevitable. Um, so whenever you have open source software, whenever there's a disagreement in direction, the response is always to hard fork it. And this has been a concern about Bitcoin for three, four years is, OK, it's an open source project. But what happens when people disagree? How do you fork money? It's a little bit of a different situation than when you're forking you know, an operating system. Um, and so in this respect, again, it's inevitable. And so I'm glad to kind of see it come to a head and for us to move past some of these big walls of worry that have been holding us back. My view is that forks are an amazing way to allow 
crypto or to allow the world to achieve progression. And that's because, of course, you ride the chain until you ride the chain that you like until the time that you think you can add more value to the chain. And then you split off the chain and you do amazing things. And if you succeed, then the ch you add value to both chains. And if you don't, well, we still got the original chain. Do you agree? I actually think that's I think that's probably true. I mean, especially when you have, you know, within a particular community, um, you know, you have a lot of infighting. It's better to just kind of let those groups go in different ways and try different things. I mean, even with all these forks that we have coming up with Bitcoin, each of them is trying something a little bit different than the other. Um, you know, the chances that any of them come up with some spectacular innovation, probably pretty low. But as the number of these forks increases, the probability that we get a significant innovation in one of these, you know, could be relatively high. So Spencer, the million dollar question, or actually with you, I believe it's actually way more than a million dollars, but uh, you got Bitcoin Cash and you're going to get Bitcoin Gold. Are you going to hold your Bitcoin Cash and your Bitcoin Gold or are you going to sell them? You know, I don't have a lot of long term conviction in any of the ones that we've seen so far. Um, you know, I'm, I'm not going to commit to selling it immediately on day one. I like to kind of play it safe and make sure that I can safely move and transact my coins before I do anything. And then it's kind of wait and see where the market aligns. We still don't know which businesses are going to support which coin. Um, and, and so I like to take a wait and see approach before committing to anything. That was Spencer Bogart and he's uh, in LA at the BlockCon conference. Lauren, he's uh, also selling his Bitcoin uh, gold and he's potentially selling his uh, Bitcoin 2x coins. When the split happens in November and we get you know, two coins again, you get Bitcoin Core and Bitcoin 2X, are you going to hold your 2X coins or are you going to sell your 2X coins? Well, I'm certainly not going to just sell it. You know, I think uh, there is a lot of industry support for this 2X. A lot of major companies like BitPay and Zappo, they're all expecting 2X to become the main chain and that's why they haven't put the sort of protections to allow both uh, chains to exist. So it's going to be interesting to see how it pans out. Um, but uh, I think uh, selling either would probably be short-sighted at this time. What do you think the support's going to be for 2x? Is it going to be a 95% support or is it going to be a 70% support? Well, a very important part of this community are the merchants uh, and uh, you know, the people providing actual usable applications for Bitcoin. So uh, if there's going to be a lot of merchant and industry support for this 2x chain, then I think uh, you know, uh, whether the core uh, one megabyte uh, people like it or not, uh, it could easily shift, power could shift in that regard. With all this talk about Bitcoin and Bitcoin shooting through the roof while the rest of the coins take a beating, and specifically, the one that I'm disappointed about is Ethereum. And to talk about Ethereum, I've got Dr. Angus Harvey, who's the founder of Future Crunch. Uh, Angus, why? What's going on with Ethereum? Why is Bitcoin running and Ethereum? Well, Ethereum can't crack $300. I wanted to talk a little bit about why I'm a bull on Ethereum and its coin, Ether. And to explain that, I uh, wanted to talk a little bit about why I thought Ethereum it seems to be stuck at around 300, whereas Bitcoin is now getting up to an all time high. I mean, getting close to, four, to, to the 5,000 mark now. So, I mean, Ethereum's also having chain splits or forks. Mm. Um, how come no one's running in to buy the Ethereum uh, token? I'm not, I'm not entirely sure of the reason. What is happening is on the, in the next few days, October 16th or October 17th, we're going to see a hard fork on the Ethereum blockchain uh, where they're doing what they call the Byzantium upgrade. And effectively, the Byzantium upgrade is a series of patches on the Ethereum code that will allow it to have better privacy. It means that we're going to improve the transaction times by around 10 seconds per block. And they're also reducing the reward that goes to miners from about five ether to three ether per block. Let's talk about those things uh, uh, separately because they are actually separate topics. So one, with this Byzantin upgrade, or, or does this make Ethereum really scalable? Can Ethereum then mm. become real world scalable? So the problem with these kinds of patches, and you're also seeing in Bitcoin, you're seeing with a number of other coins and crypto uh, as well, is that all of these patches, things where you want to increase the block size or you make things slightly better, is it tends to kick the scalability can down the road. Okay. Because if Bitcoin or Ether or any of the other cryptocurrencies are going to be visa killers, if they're going to be the de facto medium of exchange globally for the new global economy, they need to be starting to do the kinds of things that Visa is doing, where Visa can transact 20,000 and up to 50 or 60,000 transactions per second. Right now, Ether is transacting about seven per second, and Bitcoin, I think, does seven about five. Thousand or seven? Seven transactions per second. So if you look at the difference between Ether and Bitcoin, which are about five to seven transactions per second, and Visa, which can go up to 50,000 transactions per second, 
you can see there's such a long way to go that we're not going to be seeing any visa killers anytime soon. Okay, you also mentioned that the reward to the miners is going to be reduced. Now, already I've been hearing in the community that e Ether mining is not very profitable anymore. Mm. In fact, the guys are now buying machines to mine other coins because Ether mining is not profitable. What's the logic of, of reducing the incentive to miners? I'm not entirely sure what the Ethereum developers, what the, their thinking was behind that. Uh, what, what I'm more interested in is trying to get into their mindset and trying to think about why Ethereum actually is a long-term good investment. I talked about why scalability isn't going to be possible. There's a flip side to that, though. And in order to understand that flip side, I think it's also quite important to understand the mindset of the core developers on the Ethereum blockchain. So let's talk about the mindset. You right. said to me that they're the smartest people in the room. Yeah. Tell me more. The Ethereum kids, the people that are taking that on, are way more ambitious than any other crypto crowd out there. They have the kinds of ambitions that nobody else is even thinking about. What they want to do is they want to create what they call the Internet of Agreements. And obviously that's possible because the Ethereum protocol allows for the use of smart contracts, which means it can do way more than just crypto and yes. cryptocurrency. But there are a lot of blockchains that allow for smart contracts at the moment. So mm. what makes you think that Ethereum is going to be the one to win? Well, Ethereum was the first people to actually come up with that. They were the ones who came up with this idea of smart contracts on the blockchain in the first place. They've been doing it longer than anybody else. They have greater interest. Their community is tighter. And the other thing that they're doing is they're starting to say, well, if we can create this thing called the Internet of Agreements, it becomes a new digital substrate for the global economy. So in, in effect, we, what we do is we get to build a new layer on top of the Internet. And the thing about that layer is the size of the protocol in that layer is way bigger, whereas the layer on top of where all the applications get built is quite thin. So they are thinking really big. They're not going to get there for another year or two because the kinds of c the patches that they need to build onto the code aren't quite ready yet, but I think that once we start seeing them get to the point where they actually can start getting the scalability issue right, where they can get their privacy and security issues sorted to transact things on that kind of scale, and once we get the kind of interest globally that's starting to happen in other crypto like Bitcoin, then I think Ethereum will become the new de facto blockchain and Bitcoin will look like MySpace to Ethereum's Facebook. I love, I love the way you phrase it. So you're a bull, you're an Ethereum bull at $300 and despite the fact that it can't climb or it can't keep chasing Bitcoin, you're buying at the moment. Absolutely. I think Ethereum is a great long-term investment at the moment. Uh, I think what we're going to see is when we have the Byzantium hard fork in the next couple of days, we're going to see a lot more interest in the Ethereum blockchain. And over the long term, I think it actually is the safest and strongest bet for anyone who's thinking of investing in crypto. So tonight's been another power jam-packed show. It's been all about forks. And if you still don't understand what's going on with the forks and why people are buying Bitcoin today, you can find me on Twitter at CryptoManRun and I'll answer any questions that you may have about forks or anything to do with cryptocurrencies. I also asked another question on my Twitter and the question is very simple. Do you think that any bank would have the guts to sponsor a cryptocurrency show on CNBC Africa? Let me know on my Twitter at CryptoManRun. Until next week, happy trading.